I was sitting in my office late Friday night reviewing several candidates who had heard there was a job opening in our office. I worked as a regional manager for a chemical company that supplied chemicals for weed control, fertilizer, and water retention in the soil. Our livelihood depended on the farmers who grew or fed us what we ate. Because of our commitment to sustainability, we were the first company whose products were recognized as 100% environmentally friendly. The husbands of two of my office staff were promoted, resulting in their resignations. Both were moving within the next three months. We needed to find their replacements as soon as possible. Our sales department covered eight states located in the heart of flyover country. Sales growth this year had exceeded expectations. Kathy, my executive assistant, looked into my office and said, Ed, all eight people have confirmed their interview times for Monday. I'm off, so good night. Every Thursday, I traveled to one of the states in my region for a half-day sales meeting on Friday before heading home. As a result, Thursday evening turned into an evening where my wife would go out with the girls. Over the years, it has become worth the considerable expense of paying for a babysitter. My weekly visits provided our sales reps with the personal contact they needed to help them with their performance and performance issues. This paid big dividends over the years. I never lost a single person in eight years, and that was considered an accomplishment for the company. I just got back today and had time to check on a few cases before heading home. The company has been trying to get me to give up this part of my job for several years now. But I've found that time alone gives me a chance to think things through in my own way. With a know-it-all wife and three kids, the quiet time spent driving was invaluable. It also saved our branch from having to hire a sales manager. I had experienced working in a budget-cutting environment, and I wanted to keep it that way. Our children are in junior and senior high school, and the oldest girl, my pride and joy, is graduating in the fall and attending Southeast Missouri State University. My employer has awarded her a full scholarship. My youngest daughter had just turned 16 and was busy studying for her GED. My wife of 20 years, Grace, was working as an executive assistant district attorney and had held that position the year before our youngest daughter was born. He had just been offered a new position as a lawyer in the federal government, and he accepted. The feds seemed to like his uncompromising hardball approach. He'd be a fool to turn it down since it was double the money. He was supposed to start work in four months. I could never understand him. He was about the same age as me, but he never married. I didn't know for sure, but contrary to rumors, I didn't think he was gay. Every second weekend of the month for the past 15 years, my three children have been taken away by my parents so that my wife and I could have some time to ourselves. When they started doing this, my wife and I found ourselves at a crossroads in our marriage. My parents felt that we needed some time to ourselves, without the kids. I have to admit it was the greatest gift they could have given us, because it gave my wife and I time to find ourselves again. If they hadn't done that, we would have been another example of divorce. They had about three months before it was supposed to be over as Amy, my oldest daughter, was going to work in our senator's office in Washington, D.C. for the summer before starting her undergraduate degree in political science. Some time ago, my father, with my permission, bought each of our three children a kit from Ancestry.com and jokingly submitted them for testing. According to their instructions, we knew there would only be a match if any of their relatives had submitted their DNA to the same program. My kids talked to me about it, and I gave my approval, saying that we all have distant relatives that we don't remember or know about. Perhaps this would open up a new adventure for us. Amy offered to surprise their mother until we got the results. We knew it could take up to five or six months to get an answer. This weekend, we traveled to Nashville to visit the Grand Old Opry and were returning home on Sunday. My wife was the one who planned this special trip as a way to create another memory in our life's journey. I met my wife Grace in my final year of university at a soccer match. No, I wasn't one of the players on the field. I was one of those no-name grunts selling overpriced food to the spectators in the stands. She was one of the youngest daughters of the medical coach, so she always got free tickets. She had an argument with her beau over some stupidity that one of them took the wrong way. The jostling alternated with the pushing. I found myself in the center of things. She pushed him and stepped aside. He saw her movement and hit me with all his weight from the back. I fell and rolled down the concrete stairs and the tray of food rolled with me. The next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital with my head bandaged. According to the doctor, I had 25 stitches because of my spit-up forehead. Grace must have felt guilty because she came every day to make sure I was okay. She met my whole family before I started seeing daylight again. They told me later that I was in a coma for almost a week because of internal injuries. 
When the fog around my vision began to clear, I saw an unknown goddess standing in front of me. At first I thought I had arrived at the pearly gates, and she was my angel guide. Then my friend appeared beside her, clear as light. Esmeralda was not impressed with the vision standing beside her. I closed my eyes and drifted into sleep, praying that Esmeralda wouldn't be there when I woke up, and that it would all be a dream. When I woke up, the dream was still around, but Esmeralda wasn't. Esmeralda decided she had to find a new sweetheart to mess around with her. God favored my prayer. Grace stood next to me, never asking me anything while I was slowly getting my life together. I never asked her, but eventually we started dating. One thing led to another. When we graduated, I went into sales and she found her first job as a management assistant. At one of the family reunions, her younger cousin asked why she was still single, and she said because Ed hadn't proposed to me. Three months later, I stood at the altar and watched the goddess walk toward me. Five feet eight inches tall, with long blonde hair, deep bluish, almost black eyes, and a figure that made men drool. Grace and I married. By the fifth year, we had both reached the point where we were ready to break up. To this day, I couldn't understand why or how we were separated. For all I knew, she didn't understand either. We had just stopped at Lambert's on the way home. To me, this restaurant lived off its reputation. What they liked most was throwing huge buns across the room into the air to be caught by customers, because all the other food was outdated, overcooked crap. We stopped at this tourist trap because it reminded my wife of her mother's home cooking. Need I say more? For some reason, my wife reached over and turned off our sound system. When she did that, it meant she wanted to discuss something serious. I reached into my jacket pocket and turned on the recorder. It was a trick I used to maintain confidentiality when I thought I might need to confirm what I'd said later. Ed, my wife Grace asked, have you ever thought about having an affair? My first thought was what brought this on. My second was why is she asking this? Does she have a child or does she know someone who does? Why does she think it's important enough to talk about it right now? I had to clear my mind of the questions before I could speak. Grace, let's be honest, I said. Everyone's been thinking about the affair. The better question is whether I've ever acted on it, and the answer is no. Why not? asked Grace. Because I said my vows when we got married, I said. They meant something to me, and they still do. As society's attitudes have changed, Grace says, marriage vows no longer have the value they used to. I think you should forget about them and seriously consider finding a mistress with whom you would be compatible. If you're worried about your own guilt, consider that I personally allow you to have such a woman with my unconditional blessing. Having such a woman can help you to appreciate our relationship even more, as well as give you a deeper understanding of what we are. In this way, you will be free to receive the full value and enjoyment of the relationship when you find the right woman you want to have a relationship with, without the burden of guilt. I had a problem with her new point of view because it implied that using other people for her own pleasure and gain was acceptable to her. That was not the case for me. It was a side of her personality that I had never seen before. It made me change my perspective considerably. Answer me this question, my beloved wife, I said. Why is my open affair with your approval so important to you? Have I done something so disgusting to you that you want to find an excuse to destroy our marriage? After five minutes of silence, I turned the sound system back on. The lack of response spoke volumes. Grace always had an answer for everything. Now she was silent. I asked myself why. I now believe that my loving wife had a definite reason why she wanted me to have an affair. But why? Regardless of the reason, I now firmly believe that something was seriously wrong in our lives. I knew I had to find out exactly what it was. I had been driving for about an hour. We were about 40 miles from home when I saw my wife turn the sound off again. I reached for my jacket and turned on the recorder. I'm sorry, Ed, Grace said. I guess I've been reading too many Harlequin romance stories. Those ideas must have come from somewhere out of left field. With those words, she turned our sound system back on, figuring that would be the end of it. The problem was that our three kids and I knew she hated those books because they were her mother's favorite books. All her life she had called them trailer trash, and she was beyond that. Every time her mother handed her the last of her books, Grace would bring them home and throw them in the trash. After driving the last 40 miles, I realized that the one thing I didn't know much about was her Thursday nights with the girls. We didn't consider it something important or serious enough to worry about. On those rare occasions when I was home, 
she willingly changed her schedule to be home and with me. Until today, I had no reason to doubt those nights because I trusted her completely. The problem I had to face was that the conversation I'd just had gave me reason to question what those Thursday night bachelorette parties were all about. Was she going out with girls to bars and having questionable relationships like one-night stands? When I got home, I realized I had to find out what was going on during her bachelorette party. We pulled into our driveway as our kids did with my parents. When we got inside, I treated both of my parents to a rye and coke. They told me about what they and the kids had done over the weekend. For my parents, the time spent with their grandchildren was invaluable. According to them, it was the grandchildren who helped them to stay young and modern. Each activity was organized with them in mind, so my parents were exposed to things they had never done before. They were there for about an hour, after which they headed home. I walked them both to the car. Ed, Dad asked quietly, when would be the best time for us to stop by your office tomorrow for a private conversation? I have interviews all day, I said. Let's say about three hours. Whatever the problem is, I'm here for you. The problem isn't with mom and me, Dad said in a whisper. It concerns your wife and her youngest daughter. I'd better not say anything more since your wife is watching us. Okay, Dad, I can do it. I'll stop by your place after work and we can fix it in half an hour. I said loud enough for Grace to hear it through the window. After watching them drive away, I went inside and got my car keys. Then I took my toolbox and threw it in the trunk. Hi, honey, I said. I need to stop by my dad's tomorrow and make something for him after work, so I might be a few minutes late. I heard you from the window, Grace said. Don't worry, we can eat a little later. My dad showed up on time with my mom. They were escorted into my office. We sat down at the desk and waited for one of the staff to bring us coffee. As soon as the coffee was served, Kathy closed my office door, getting ready to leave. Ed, my father said, I'm really sorry about my stupid prank of sending our grandchildren's DNA. They found a DNA match for April. She has a paternal grandmother who is looking for her son and his descendants. With those words, he pulled out a form from Ancestry.com. It contained the woman's name and phone number. I was devastated. My father, just by looking at me, realized how much the news had hit me. Dad, I don't think they made a mistake, so let's see what we can all figure out, I said. Using the office phone, I dialed the number and turned on the recording function and speaker. I wanted to make sure I had a permanent record of the conversation. The phone rang twice before it was answered. My name is Edward Paul Adams, and I'm looking for Mrs. Beatrice Smith from a DNA match found thanks to Ancestry.com, I said. May I speak to her, please? You're talking to her young man, the woman said. How can I help you? It's complicated, I said. Long story short, my youngest daughter, as I just found out, is your granddaughter. You mean April Marie Adams, she asked. Yes, it is, I replied. Then perhaps you know my son, who I had to give up for adoption when I was only 15, she said. I might if I knew his name, I said. He was adopted by a family with the last name Barrow, and his middle name at the time was Luke Robert, Mrs. Smith said. My face turned white. Tears came to my parents' eyes because we knew the name well. Her honest, straightforward remark turned into a hellish nightmare for me. He's alive and well, I said. He's now a district attorney in Cape Girardeau County, Missouri. He is also my wife's boss. I can tell you that he's never been married, and now I think I know why. He's my only child, she said. I have stage four lung cancer and I don't have long to live. Would you allow your daughter April to visit me before I come to the end of my life? If you can't afford it, I'll gladly pay for the ticket. I'd like to meet her to give her my inheritance. Mrs. Smith, under the circumstances, I'll let you make arrangements with my parents. Since you are only one state away, they will take her on a special weekend trip so you can get to know her, I said. I don't think I would let my daughter go on a trip like that alone. Is there anything else you want me to do? Get me a notarized statement authorizing my attorney to conduct a DNA test, Mrs. Smith said. Because of the value of April's inheritance, he will want to make sure she is who we think she is before changing my will? No problem, I'll pass this call on to my father, I said. He can work out the details and get directions on how to get to you. I stood up, 
walked out of the office and handed Kathy my personal tape recorder, saying, Transcribe and notarize both my conversation and the phone conversation I'm still recording. I'll need them for the divorce court. Do you want me to process the authorization for the DNA test? Kathy asked. Katie was smart. She remembered that when I turned on the tape, she should listen in silence. In the past, this had been done, and many conflicts were quickly resolved. Yes, I said. But we have to keep it a secret for a few weeks. I want to find out what my soon-to-be-divorced wife does on Thursdays. I walked into my assistant's office and said, David, I need to speak with you and your wife as soon as possible. I'm going to need your cooperation on a personal matter. David looked at me and immediately realized that what I needed help with was very serious. She's about to be released from dispatch, David said. I'll text her to come right over. I went back to my office and we worked it out. Using my house key, they would pack April's clothes and leave the following Friday. I would pick her up from school and drop her off at their place by 10 o'clock. I was walking my parents to the exit when David's wife walked in. I told her to go to his office and I would join them shortly. Thanks to modern communications, Kathy already had copies made and transcribed. I gave a copy to David and Cheryl to read. I suggested that they first familiarize themselves with the conversation between my wife and me. I gave Kathy the paper my father had given me to make photocopies of what my father had received. From my attorney's file that we were in the process of creating and told her to find the best one for me. Both Cheryl and David had known my wife and me for many years. Both took what they learned today very hard. Cheryl and Grace grew up in each other's neighborhood. Although they were never close, they naturally knew everything about each other. She was shocked to learn the reality of what had remained unknown until now. Do you think there's any chance they're still lovers after all these years? Cheryl asked. Or was it one of those situations they got into and then realized their mistake? I don't know, but I'm going to need your cooperation to find out, I said. For the next few weeks, I need David to take the company car to travel to sales meetings. Cheryl, I'll need to drive your car because no one will be looking for it. So I need you to drive David's car. I'll let corporate know that we're doing this as part of your cross-training, David, so I'm afraid you'll have to do it for the next three months. You're going to follow your wife around on Thursday nights and write down everything you can, David said, because your wife will still believe you make your weekly trips. My intuition tells me it's still going on, because why would my wife suddenly suggest I have an affair with her blessing, I said. If Barrow hadn't changed jobs, nothing would have changed. I believe Grace may be planning to move in with Luke Robert Barrow when he starts working in St. Louis. If Grace could prove that I was having an affair, it would justify in her eyes filing for divorce. Shit, Cheryl said. I can see Grace doing something like that. It's become acceptable in our society to blame the opposition for something you've already done. It's an effective way to take your eyes off your own behavior. Ed, if you find proof on one of these Thursday evenings, Cheryl said. Call me and I'll have the dispatcher have a couple of blues call her and her lover and tell them you were in an accident. That way, I can get a detailed police report on what state they were dressed or undressed in and where they ended up. A few of the cops would like to get a little revenge on the DA for what he's done against them in the past. Kathy looked over and said, Dale Allen Britton left the DA's office four months ago because he could no longer work for him and opened his own practice. I faxed his office everything we have so far and he's expecting you. You'd better hurry. Ed, give Dale my regards and best wishes, Cheryl said, and tell him we still miss him. I walked out the door to meet the man who was on his way to the Supreme Court with the women's right to life movement because of Roe v. Wade. The way he looked at the law and how to apply it put everything he was involved with upside down. Things were getting clearer. Grace and I had started having marital problems right after she started working for Luke Barrow. That's when I was promoted to sales manager and had to start traveling 24 hours a day to meet with salespeople. If they were still having an affair every Thursday night, I had been their unknowing cuckold for over 15 years. They had to laugh at me behind my back. Now the expensive Christmas and birthday presents from Luke made sense. Dale was waiting for me when I got out of the car. I found out that Cheryl had called him about our plans. Dale had even supplied me with the key I needed to access Luke Barrow's house and the code to disable the alarm system if it was set. He handed me a piece of paper with a phone number on it. At this number, he said, you will find those who can provide you with the service at a reasonable price. 
I have spoken to them, and they are waiting for your call. He explained he grew up on the street and still has connections to pull some things off. The codes for the Barrow home, he said, will be in effect until the end of next week, and then Luke Barrow will receive a monthly reminder to change his access codes. He was going to sue Barrow for child support from the day April was born. Luke Barrow was going to have a lot of expenses. Under state law, you couldn't get rid of it by declaring bankruptcy. If Dale got his way, his former boss would be broke before he was done. He was going to sue my wife, Grace, accusing her of adultery, abandonment, and fraud for knowingly passing off Luke Barrow's daughter as mine. It was Dale who offered to temporarily transfer my parental rights to April to my parents until the court case was settled. I asked him why. Dale explained that that way they couldn't say you were using April against them. I know Luke will go after you as dirty and sneaky as he can. He'll treat you the same way he treats all the lowlifes. Give them maximum time for the slightest offense. Sometimes the best offense is the greatest offense. I offered to use my debit card to prepay for his services, and he said no. Your wife will see it right away and can guess what you are doing. Write me a check and I will hold on to it until they are serviced. As soon as I left, I knew from his thoughts that everything he was doing was to give me an advantage and time to figure things out. Kathy really found the best thing for me. I was left with the impression that Dale had his own reason for pursuing Luke Barrow in this way. Both Grace and Luke were about to face shit they never thought possible. Dale Britton had just created his own version of the divorce game. I signed all the necessary paperwork for my parents to get parental rights to April as of Friday and gave them a copy. After Dale and I explained the whole situation to them, they agreed that it made sense. I was waiting for Cheryl to arrive in her 2002-year-old model Ford Taurus. David was going on his first sales trip. Cheryl would leave her car at my place and take David home. My oldest told me that their mom wouldn't be home for dinner, as she was going to join the girls right after work. As soon as Cheryl arrived, everything was switched over and I threw my suitcase in the trunk. Ed, Cheryl said. Dispatch and all the guys on board. All I need is to know where. Thanks, I said. Dale said to call him if things got going so he could personally serve them. I'd like to know why Dale wants Luke Barrow out. With Dale, it's a matter of principle, Cheryl said. Luke has trouble backing up what he says. It was interesting to watch Grace and Luke drive away in their cars. Both stopped at Charlie's Bar and Grill and had a first-class steak each. Then one went one way and the other went the other. I, on the other hand, just pulled up to Luke Barrow's house and waited. Dale's friends and my crew had already set up. I was in a safe place with a direct view of Luke's house. Grace was the first to show up. After entering the code into the box to disable the alarm, she used her own key to unlock the door. We filmed her long enough to see her enter the house. Ten minutes later, Luke pulled up. Grace opened the door to greet him. Her blouse was completely open and her bra was missing. Her full cleavage was on full display. Luke pulled Grace into his arms and gave her a deep, loving kiss. As they kissed, I noticed his hands began to play with her breasts. As soon as they closed the door, I stopped filming. Six of the eight rooms in Luke's house were wired for video and sound. Luke Barrow's neighbor's son was serving a long prison sentence. He agreed to let us use his house as a base. Everything that was filmed at the Barrow house was streamed live to all the Facebook pages they were connected to. We found out that I had a crew following my car because Grace believed I would take the bait and start looking for a new mistress as early as tonight. Since she knew my schedule, they hooked up with a prostitute they hired because she knew my taste. I texted Cheryl to let her know what I had just overheard. She called her husband David to let him know he was being followed. Being a former Marine, he took direct protective action and intentionally drove his car off the road at 10 o'clock at night. He then had to call a tow truck to get it out. He called his wife to report the accident. She texted me. I replied that everything was fine and gave her the address. While I waited to see what would happen, I slipped over to the Burroughs house and took the valves out of all the tire rods on their car because I didn't want them to have a chance to start cleaning up the mess they would be in. The lovers wouldn't be going anywhere for a long time. The police officers, flashing their blue lights, pulled up to the house and began looking for Grace Adams. Luke Burroughs tried to deny her presence until the officers pointed out that her car was parked in the driveway. Finally, Grace appeared in the doorway, wrapped in a sheet. Mrs. Grace Adams, your husband Edward Paul's car was involved in an accident near Little Rock, Arkansas. It was your parents who offered to find you here when you couldn't be found. 
I took great pleasure in seeing Grace's face turn white. The policeman had deliberately lied to her to make them both uncomfortable. After that, the police officers got into their cruiser and drove off, and I followed them, keeping up with them. From the moment the police arrived until the moment they left, everything was recorded and streamed live on Facebook. We had proof that the case was ongoing, and so did the people of the Cape. At midnight, my oldest daughter Amy called, Daddy, Mom isn't home yet, and my calls are going to her answering machine. I'm starting to worry that she doesn't usually come in this late. What should I do? Call Luke Barrow and ask him to put you through to your mother, I said, sending her the number. What does her boss have to do with this? Amy asked. He's been her girlfriend on Thursdays for over 16 years, I said. I hung up and sent Amy part of a clip of Grace in a sheet talking to the cops and Luke Barrow, wearing nothing but pajama pants, from the burning phone. Ten minutes later, Amy called again and said, Mom's phone suddenly worked again. She called me. She said she was on Lower East Broadway with four flat tires. I realized she was lying and told her it couldn't be true, because it was right next door to Luke Barrow's house. She said she was telling me the truth, and I told her I saw a clip of her and her lover talking to the cops. She told me what the clip was and I sent it to her. Mom couldn't explain to me why she was wearing a sheet. I wasn't expecting her home for a few hours, but you could do me a favor and open the front door, I said. I was getting out of the car when my daughter Amy saw me. She watched me take my suitcase out of the trunk and walk toward her. No sooner had I set my suitcase on the floor than my cell phone rang. It was Dale Allen Britton. I answered it and put it on speaker. Ed, I just served them both at his house, Dale said. Now your wife and her lover are forbidden to come within 500 feet of you and your children. I will notify the Cape Police Department before I return home. Do yourself a favor, don't talk to her at all, Dale added. If she shows up even for clothes, call the police. Got it, and so did my oldest daughter, I said. Thanks, Dale. Amy, go open the garage so I can move Cheryl's car into it, I said. I have to be in Little Rock. That's what we did. Dad, is that why the locksmith came around six to change the locks? Asked Amy. Yeah, it was done at the last minute, I said. I got Kathy to order it because it was becoming obvious that it was going to go the way we planned. What brought this on? Asked Amy. The DNA test your grandfather sent to Ancestry.com, I said. They got a match on April. He told me about it at work on Monday. When I contacted the woman, it turns out your mother's boss is her son, who she gave up for adoption when she was 15. Amy, my daughter, lost her temper. I held her tightly until she calmed down. Then we turned off the lights and went into the kitchen to talk quietly. I turned on the tape recorder and let Amy listen to the conversation her mother and I had when we were driving back from Nashville. It was very informative to hear her mother's words from her own mouth. Why does mom want you to have an affair, dad? Amy asked. To negate the repercussions of what she did, should it be found out, I said. It's sad that her assumption led to the truth coming out. There was a quiet knock on the door. Since I wasn't supposed to be home, Amy answered it. It was a police officer who informed us that they had stopped the cab Grace was in and told her that she would be violating a court order if she drove on. My eldest daughter and I discussed all of this for the rest of the evening. We both agreed that Grace should have been a writer because she always had a story to tell about her girlhood. I still can't believe Mom had an ongoing affair with the same man for over 16 years, Amy said. Why didn't we see that? That was easy, I said. You kids were young. I was a sales manager who had to travel regularly to different states for meetings every week. Out of trust in us as a couple, I saw no reason not to give your mom my blessing for weekly night outings with the girls. We all trusted her, Amy said. That's what made us blind to what was going on behind the scenes. I sat stunned. If my daughter hadn't said that, I never would have seen it. She was the one who had used our trust in her that had allowed her to go unpunished for so long. Amy saw the tears filling my eyes and said, That's what hurts the most. It's not the cheating or the lying. It's the realization that she used our beliefs about her deliberately as a tool to continue the only relationship that meant anything to her. If your mother did that to someone she claimed to love, I said. Imagine what she'll do to us when she starts hating us for what she's going through.
Amy got up to make us both a fresh cup of coffee. At that moment, I realized that dawn had already begun. A text notification came to my phone. It's from your mom. She'd like to be able to talk to me as soon as possible, I said. She says that my eldest and I have some family issues that we need to discuss before I return from my trip. How are you going to respond to her? My daughter asked worriedly. Don't worry. Be happy Luke and you can still laugh at the big dumbass behind my back, I said as I wrote this. You can still move to St. Louis with Luke Barrow, which was your plan all along, just not with our kids. Amy looked at me in utter shock. Your mother doesn't need me anymore, I said. My usefulness to her was exhausted. She wanted me to have an affair so she could use it against me in divorce court. She didn't think for a second that after all this time she'd be caught. It must have been very painful for Amy to hear the words I wrote to her mother. Not many people are able to recognize the pure truth about anything. Most will call the one who reveals it all the nasty names they know, because the real truth hurts. In time, they will accept it. I stood up and took my daughter in my arms as she began to shed tears again. We managed to calm her down before we heard Eric and April stirring. I turned on the TV in the kitchen to channel Kavos 12 to watch the local morning news like I always did. Soon they were having breakfast to start the day. They were surprised to see me at home. We were all surprised to see an image of my wife on the screen. My son turned up the volume out of curiosity. At that moment, I felt sorry for my children because Luke and she were discussing how stupid and dumb I was. Grace said bluntly, That fool is such a mourn and he doesn't notice everything going on around him. Then their mother made a sarcastic remark about me, which made them both burst into laughter. Then the reporter spoke. I don't think they're laughing anymore, he said. After watching five hours of the longtime lover's Facebook behavior live, their plan to set Edward Adams up with a professional prostitute so she would divorce him and take everything he had blew their minds. In the next scene, Dale sues them both. The reporter explained what the lawsuits were for. Alice just ran over to me and sat on my lap sobbing. It was a hell of an unpleasant way for a 16-year-old girl to find out that her father was not her biological father, but her mother's longtime lover. Eric summed it up by saying, If you're just a piece of shit in your mom's eyes, what does that do to the rest of us? Once April calmed down, Amy helped me explain what had happened since my mom and I got back from Nashville. I called the school and asked them to release them from school for Friday and Monday to give them time to adjust and deal with their emotions. We were about to start breakfast when April said, Daddy, the chief of police is coming. That got our attention, and we turned up the volume again. It has now been publicly announced that both Grace Adams and Luke Barrow, our current district attorney, are being criminally prosecuted. A task force from across the county is being assembled to investigate. I thought that when a person's behavior becomes public, the masses cannot publicly accept what they do privately. Hypocrisy rules our society every day. After breakfast and cleaning up, I sat my three children down at the table. I showed each of them a copy of the letter my father had received. Then I said, April, my parents are picking you up to take you to meet your biological father's mother. She is dying of cancer and has asked to meet with you. There's a very good reason for that, but I think it's best to have the woman you're meeting with explain it to you. As far as I'm concerned, you are my daughter and always will be. Other than that, if you have any questions, ask your grandparents. Amy, will you help your sister pack for the weekend while I call my parents? I asked. As soon as the girls left, my son asked, How do you handle it, Daddy? No, I replied. I find myself in a constant struggle to keep my cool. Remember, son, if this ever happens to you, as a father, you have to stay strong for all the other people in your life. With these words, I called my parents and explained where I was. They said they would come as soon as they finished loading the car. They still had an hour before they had to catch their plane. I didn't realize that it was at that moment that my son and I's relationship was forever changed for the better. The three of us watched the daughter I had raised leave with my parents to see her biological grandmother for the first time. I prayed above all that everything would go well and that she would return with the same feelings I had. The DA's office looks like a morgue. Grace Adams went shopping for new clothes after her car was towed and four tires replaced. Luke Barrow read the lawsuit filed against him. Although they didn't have a direct DNA sample, they had linked him biologically in such a way that there was no way he could deny his parentage. Now all the staff knew the truth about their relationship, 
and years-long affair. This, and the fact that they had hidden April Adams' true background, was becoming a political nightmare. Under the law, the term fraud was eventually expanded to include the failure to disclose all material facts about a situation. Because of this, Dale filed a civil suit against Grace and against him together. It was looking more and more like they as a couple had been defrauding her husband Ed for years. All the lawyers he had approached said that Ed Adams and Dale Britton would succeed. The same attorneys he had approached so far wanted nothing to do with it. Most of them had already heard what Dale had done the last time he appeared as a defendant. It was noted that most defenses are based on the assumption that a scheme of certain facts will be presented in such a way that they can be challenged. In Dale's case, when he made his arguments in court, most found that by the time he was done, they had no defense. The exposure of their behavior on Facebook and the apparent admission by the two that they were trying to destroy an honest man so that together they could seize as much of his estate as possible would have meant little, but because of his position in the community, it became front-page news. Grace had just walked out of a store she had been going to for years because of the quality and uniqueness of the clothes. The last thing she expected was to run into a woman who would ask if she was crazy, because she should have known it would end badly. When Grace asked what the woman was talking about, she learned that the woman said she had been a freaking porn star on Facebook for at least five hours. She returned to Luke's house around 1 p.m. and found that the company had just finished service. They mistook her for the homeowner and suggested that her husband and her reset all the security codes in the house. It wasn't until they left that she realized she hadn't been asked to confirm with an electronic signature that they were there. She called Luke and asked who wanted to make sure he didn't take the new position in St. Louis. When he asked why, she told him what she had come back for. Then they began to believe that Ed was just protecting himself because they both knew that his new job was a political appointment from the deep state. After making herself some coffee, she sat down at the table and looked over the divorce petition. The first blow was dealt when she learned that it was her words to her husband that had made him suspicious. Her husband was perplexed as to why she was asking him to intentionally hurt and use another human being for her own personal gratification. But it was mom and dad Adams who informed him of the DNA match. This allowed him to determine April's true origins and was undeniable proof that she was having an affair. Grace began to realize that Ed must now know that it was her behavior that almost caused their breakup before April was even born. At that moment, she realized that Ed must know that it was still going on. It was Ed who was behind what had happened last night. It was Ed who was revealing the hidden facts of her life. As she took another sip of coffee, the doorbell rang. She stood up, walked to the front door, and opened it, finding that it was the neighbor Luke didn't like. Mr. Primrose, she said. What can I do for you? He handed her an envelope of legal documents and said, Ed, your husband used my apartment as a base of operations for his operations against you and your longtime lover last night. I was happy to let him do it because Luke Barrow got my son the maximum sentence as a first-time offender. I thought you might be interested to know that the information in the envelope I gave you last night will also be delivered by courier to everyone I know on your side of the family this afternoon. Ed asked me to ask if you are laughing at him now? She watched him walk away with the biggest smile on her face. Back in the kitchen, Grace opened the envelope. It was filled with pictures. They began with her letting Luke into the house with her own key. Then she meets him at the door when he comes home. Their sexual foreplay in the living room. The photos left nothing out. Even police officers were captured in them. Ed's team were professionals. The elimination had been so complete that it now felt like he was working with a bunch of cops who wanted revenge on Luke for their own reasons. But it was the last printed page, signed by her husband, that said it all. If it became public, there would be a whole host of problems they weren't prepared for. Her plans to force her husband to submit to her wishes had fallen to pieces. The question now was how to minimize the damage done by Ed, turning this into a public spectacle. Grace! Last Sunday when we got home from Nashville, I realized that you were trying to set me up to divorce me. Since then, I confess, I've been trying to figure out what I did to make your love for me turn to pure hatred. Now I know why. I see that you blame me for what you think was missing in your life when we only had two children. I think you felt trapped in your marriage and wanted your carefree bachelor life back. Otherwise, you wouldn't have turned to him to rediscover the single life. By doing so, you allowed him to take you away from what you hated for a few hours a week. I know that the only reason you stayed married to a man you hated and thought was dead 
was because Luke didn't want to take on the responsibility of raising children, even his own. With your opinion of me, there's no way you'd leave them alone with a piece of shit like me. Your pride wouldn't have allowed it. As a result, you've lived a lifetime of deliberate lies. Every day you both got away with it, and your contempt for who and what I am grew. In your eyes, I became more and more of a fool and an idiot. How many times have you and Luke laughed at this unrepentant bastard? Did you inspire him to make love to you by humiliating or ridiculing me? What I can't forgive or forget is what you and the one you consider your real husband sent to our children, because it will affect them for the rest of their lives. I can't understand how Luke and you had fun playing with me and our children's lives as if we were just chess pieces on a game board. News reporter KVO's 12 summed it up well when he asked you two if you were laughing at Grace Adams' husband Edward Adams right now. I watched Amy, Eric, and April as you and your lover, thanks to the media, flaunted what you planned to do to me. It was horrible watching our children as you joked and laughed about how easy it would be to take down this stupid goon. Eric, our only son, said, If our mother thinks you're just a piece of shit that needs to be allowed to dry before hammering you into the ground, what does she really think of us? I have not asked them what your relationship with them will be in the future. At this point, I can honestly say they don't exist. It was your and your lover Luke's utter disgust and contempt for me that led to this. At least we both know you're laughing with joy because you've left me with a reputation as a hapless goofball for the rest of my life. Perhaps tonight you can both raise a glass to victory. ED. Grace's hands trembled so violently that she dropped the paper. She looked like an angry, bitter, hateful, and cruel bitch. It was obvious that she appeared to her readers as a mother who didn't care about her children, her husband, or any other human being. The only thing she cared about was herself and the fulfillment of her carnal needs. Then her sobs broke the silence in the room. Ed was the only person she knew capable of destroying a person's credibility without directly condemning them. Everyone who read her couldn't argue with his comments about their behavior. In his eyes, everything she'd ever done was about prolonging life, not love. He should have known that Luke was the one pressuring her to leave him and the kids before April got pregnant. It was Luke's new job that made them change their long-term plans. Originally, they were going to wait until April graduated from high school. Then her true origins could be revealed without any repercussions. He was right about something, because she wasn't laughing right now. He didn't fail to point out that their own behavior proved his point. Ed believed that their contempt for who and what he was explained their attempt to destroy him completely. It was a declaration of war. If he was going to go down, he was going to take them both with him. Grace picked up the divorce petition and continued reading. It was truly crushing. One of the lawsuits against them was for fraud because they had concealed April's true origins. She was accused of emotional and mental abandonment, adultery, and defamation. But when she looked at the amount they were demanding for damages in the fraud case, she felt sick to her stomach. If he won, both Luke and she would be penniless for a very long time. Ed and his lawyer argued that they could no longer treat Ed as the jackass they thought he was. Saturday was crazy for me and my two older kids. From early morning until four in the afternoon, we had family visiting us. Grace's parents, her two brothers, one sister, and their spouses came to support us. Everyone brought one of their favorite dishes so we would have something to eat. Even my brother and sister came from out of town to check on me. The three of us were overwhelmed with love and support. Each of the people who came had a hard time understanding how they could have been deceived by Grace for so long. They all agreed that what appeared on social media was proof that she was trying to destroy me out of hate. My father-in-law and I grabbed a cold beer and went out on the back patio for a few minutes. Edward let him go, he said. Cora's in the house so you can have some privacy, and we'll keep them away until you calm down. He stayed with me until things sorted themselves out. Cora and I plan to change our will, he said. What should have been Grace's will be divided among your three children? She may be our daughter, but I'll never forgive her for what she's become. We had just finished clearing out the house when my dad called. April met this lady, my father said. You can definitely see some family resemblance. Their meeting went well. Mrs. Smith seemed interested in your family situation and got April to openly tell her how she felt about it. That was good to see because she had been keeping things to herself. The lawyer got the blood sample he needed and then invited me in for a private conversation, my father said. He asked me about Luke Barrow and I told him what we all knew. 
I learned that his real father was in prison for life for killing his mistress's husband. Luke would have been left his real mother's inheritance if April hadn't come into her life. Don't worry, Dad, I replied. Dale Britton got a court order banning him from being within 500 feet of either of us. It was a busy day, with many family members from both sides coming to offer their support. We were lodged at Mrs. Smith's estate as her guests. Your mother felt honored to be treated so regally, Dad explained. April is staying with Mrs. Smith now. We both like her. Her lawyer said he hasn't seen a smile on the grand old lady's face in a long time. Hold on, I'll put your mom on the phone. Ed, I got a chance to talk to Beatrice alone for a bit. She asked me what kind of son you were, and I talked about your life in general, trying to be as frank and honest as I could. We talked in great detail about what had happened over the past week. She told me that you left it up to her to tell April why she wanted to see her. She said it had been a long time since a stranger had shown her such respect and then thanked all of us for telling her how to handle her estate situation. My mom continued. She plans to leave everything in a trust in April's name for you to manage until she turns 25. Text me when you leave so I can be there when you bring her home, I asked before hanging up. I texted April to say we all miss you and send hi to dad. We finally had time to get everything in order before David and Cheryl arrived in my car. I had to apologize to her for forgetting to return it. The police chief sees a chance to take out Luke Barrow, Cheryl said. He and Dale are working together. Dale has handed him some questionable items for the investigators to look into. When I got back, all the staff were gloomy and upset, David says. I told them in general terms that some of us had been aware of what was going on for most of the week and had helped in any way we could. It's been an emotional roller coaster around here since Thursday night, I said. The kids still have a hard time dealing with it at times, so I'm taking Monday off too. Have you heard anything about Grace? Cheryl asked. Not since Thursday night, I replied. Luke and her are probably busy doing their own thing since they've made it publicly clear how they feel about us. My youngest daughter called me early Sunday morning and asked if she and her grandparents could come home late on Monday. I gave my blessing if her grandparents would agree. She thanked me for making her go. I asked why. April said that, Mrs. Smith made me accept the fact that it was not my fault that her mother's infidelity had brought me into the world. Mrs. Smith made Daddy understand that we were all innocent victims and didn't deserve what her son's and my mother's behavior had brought upon us. I love you, Daddy, she said before ending the conversation. On Monday night, Amy, Eric, and I watched my mom and dad pull into our driveway. My parents looked stressed and tired. As soon as she got out of the car, she immediately rushed into my arms. I had to admit it was nice to have my youngest daughter home. Her father opened the trunk and brought in her suitcase. Eric immediately carried it into her bedroom. Then the three of them went to the family room so April could tell them about her new grandmother. This gave my parents and I a chance to catch up. We went into the kitchen. While I made fresh coffee, my parents told me about their impression of Mrs. Beatrice Smith. When we left, she was calm, my father said. It was like she had reached a point where she was ready to accept her death. Meeting April and having April accept her was important to her. Mom pulled an envelope of legal documents out of her purse and handed it to me explaining, This was given to me by her lawyer, per Beatrice's instructions. I opened it and pulled out the letter. Opening the first thing I noticed was a check for 50000 The letter was short and to the point. The great lady thanked me for granting her request. She was informing me that before I contacted her, she had already lived beyond her life expectancy. DNA confirmed the biological connection. April is a beautiful girl. You have raised her well. Use the resources I have given you to get through the difficult time you are going through and don't forget your values. I gave it to my parents to read. It was hard to realize that my parents and I may have fulfilled a man's dying request. Over a cup of coffee, I explained to them everything that had happened while they were on the trip. I told them that I felt that emotionally, everything was behind us as a family and that we would be back to our normal way of life starting tomorrow. The rest of the week went smoothly. Grace tried to contact each of our children by cell phone and was told not to call again. The corporate headquarters was thrilled that I was no longer leading sales meetings and began looking for a sales manager for the first time in 10 years. 
I was sitting in my office going over the month sales figures when Kathy poked her head through the door saying, shit hit the fan. I looked up at her and asked, what now? I received a letter informing me that your latest letter to Grace was published on a Southeast Missouri newspaper website. I went to the website and found the speak out section to open it. Katie came over to my desk and started reading, looking over my shoulder. By the time she finished reading, she was sobbing. I wrote it when I was emotionally upset, I explained. Maybe I was being too harsh. No, Ed, Kathy said. You just coldly and bluntly stated what her long-term behavior shows. Either one of them could have gotten over it and come clean. Luke got the benefit of a long-term relationship without the cost. That's what I thought, I said. It's not often that the community at large gets to see what someone's behavior costs a family, and in such a public way, Katie says. For anyone who has been divorced like me, it's a stark reminder of the pain and suffering they had to go through before they could start living again. Look at that last comment, I said as I read it aloud. As a feminist for most of my life, I have fought for equality and empowerment. What this woman and her lover did to her husband and children has forever tarnished our movement. Grace and Luke were having dinner at Charlie's Bar and Grill. The place is usually packed to capacity on Friday nights, but tonight there were only empty tables around them. When they asked the waitress why, she explained that there were people waiting for us who refused to show up publicly near you. The waitress said it was probably because many people had read the publication of your husband's last letter to you, Mrs. Adams, on the Southeast Missourians website. Grace and Luke asked for the bill and quickly left knowing that they had better stay as far away from society as possible in the near future. Both of them had to accept that their world had shrunk considerably because of their behavior. As they were leaving, Grace noticed her mother and father sitting at a table waiting for their order. Grace headed toward them. Luke followed her. When she spoke, her father looked at them and said, Mr. Barrow, I suggest you get your whore out of here and let my wife and I eat in peace. Grace left the restaurant in tears, finally realizing that if she went too far, there was no turning back. She had to live with the consequences of what she and Luke had done for the rest of her life. When they got back to Luke's place, they went to the website and saw for themselves what was being written in the comments. It was clear to both of them that the public hated them both. Three months later, I sat in the passenger seat of my car and watched April drive. We had left this morning to go to Wichita, Kansas, since we had learned that her grandmother Beatrice had passed away. We were on our way to the airport to take the private jet that the estate provided us. April was having a hard time with this, as they had grown close through constant phone calls to each other when she returned from her trip. Amy and Eric helped me a lot, and all four of us became closer as a result. They both encouraged me to start dating, but I kind of kept quiet about it. Once burned, twice embarrassed. Luke and Grace were now living in St. Louis. The feds had authorized him to start work early. The county was happy to get rid of him early if he paid back over $45,000 in questionable expenses. They were now living in a rented two-bedroom apartment in case they had to declare bankruptcy because of an impending civil suit. Under Missouri bankruptcy laws, they could only keep $10,000 each. Our divorce was finalized in accordance with state law. Grace was to pay me child support while they were in school and cover 50% of their living expenses if they lived on campus. The civil fraud trial was due in two weeks. My children still refused to talk to their mother, as did her relatives. She had experienced firsthand that people can take so much crap that they then leave for good. April had to endure a meeting with her biological father, organized by the State Child Welfare Agency. It did not go well for him. She told him that his mother had told her that he, like his real father, was a drug addict who should not be allowed near any woman. In the presence of child welfare officials, April told him that both her mother and he were dead in her eyes. We attended her grandmother's funeral. Afterward, the lawyer revealed to both of us how large her inheritance was. It was overwhelming for both of us. As trustee, after discussing it with our daughter, we decided to sell her grandmother's house with all the contents except for personal jewelry and a few photographs that April wanted to take. We got home, the school year was winding down. I was getting ready for the first day of court on Wednesday when April walked into the den. Dad, can you arrange for Luke, Mom, and their lawyers to meet with the two of us and Dale on Tuesday? April said. I think so, but why? I asked. I want them to see the real cost of their actions, April says. Grandma Beatrice suggested that to me.
I called Dale and we made a deal. It was a beautiful sunny day as we sat with Luke, Grace, and their attorneys. I requested this meeting, April said. To my biological father, I want to inform him of the following. The whereabouts of your father and his request to visit him in prison. He is serving a life sentence for the murder of his mistress's husband. You must realize that you are the product of a rape committed by a distant cousin when she was 14 years old. April handed him a sealed envelope with his name on it. I savored the expression that appeared on Luke and Grace's faces. You both should know that my biological grandmother left me over $100 million to be held in trust for my father, Edward Adams, until I turned 25. It would have been your Luke if she hadn't discovered me, April stated. When she found out how I was created and what came of it, her views on morals and standards snapped. That's when she discharged you. In my grandmother's eyes, what you both did was disgusting. Dale Britton, my trust, will be paying my father's legal bills, April said. Luke and Mom, you can try to reconcile before you go to court, because if we have to, we'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. Mom, you have to realize that even though you created me in sin, that doesn't give you the right to deem it acceptable. Thankfully, my biological grandmother made me realize that it is my father's views on morals, principles, and standards that make me. Yeah. I left that meeting both proud and humbled. My daughter had said it all. What would happen tomorrow didn't matter because today I was blessed with what really mattered. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.